Greetings from uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, I'm Dr. David Daniels. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon here. I'm Justina Keating. I'm in child neurology here at Mayo Clinic. And uh, we're going to be talking today about the low-grade uh, pediatric brain tumors um, in children. Um, it's 80 degrees in Rochester this morning, so I'm very happy that we have on Thought from Winter. And uh, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. All right. I'm going to start with giving us a little bit of background um, about brain tumors in children. Um, as someone who's worked with kids with brain tumors for so, since 96, uh, people ask me things all the time. And so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. I'm not sure who all we have in our audience, so we'll, we'll uh, start with this. So epidemiology means who's getting the brain tumors, and we'll talk about brain tumor types and, and how we manage them. But incidence uh, is about 30 per million children each year. And that's you know nationwide here here in the United States. And what does that boil down to for you know, a town like Rochester or for one pediatrician's career? One pediatrician may may only ever have one or two in their whole career, uh, whereas others may seem to be the ones who are attracting them and, and having more. But um, you have to remember that this incidence is per year, and so. Uh, you may see several over over a period of time in a town or in uh, a group practice. Um, we don't think that the incidence is going up. There's always a lot of questions about that. Uh, you know, is the incidence increasing? But but our national databases don't show any real change in that way. Sure, I think that comes to about maybe four, three to four thousand children per year in the United States that are being diagnosed with uh, with brain brain tumors. So it is the leading cause of cancer death in children. Um, what used to be the number one cancer death in children is leukemia, and that's a huge success story in pediatric oncology. Um, it still occurs. It's still a, a, long, uh, a long haul with chemotherapy for those children, but it is a success story. Likewise, um, our treatment of children with brain tumors, both benign and malignant, is improving. Um, there's definitely a decline in the mortality rate um, going from two per 100,000 to now less than one per 100,000. So that's, that's a fantastic improvement overall. Mm -hmm. That's been excellent. Um, it has been studied and looked at too that in those children cared for in a multidisciplinary center, uh, the survival is better and the quality of their outcome is better too. Mm -hmm. Now, where tumors occur in children, even though the posterior fossa is the smaller kind of compartment in the brain, more tumors occur in that area. Um, you know, can you think embryologically, the cerebellum is a little more primitive. It's um, still developing more uh, after the child is born. And so perhaps that's part of the explanation that there's, it's still kind of differentiating. Not sure, but this is definitely where the uh, majority of tumors take place. Uh, that said, there's not a small amount in the supratentorial compartment. And we'll talk a little bit about some in both areas. So the infratentorial ones can be both benign and malignant types. Today, we're talking about low-grade gliomas. And so of this group of tumors, that would be the cerebellar astrocytomas. Frequently, we'll tell patients oh, or families, well, if your child had to have a brain tumor, mm -hmm. you know, a cerebellar astrocytoma is, is one of the most tolerable ones. You hate to think of any family having to kind of choose. What would you choose? Mm -hmm. uh, no one would choose to have a brain tumor, but, but it is relatively mm -hmm. approachable and, mm -hmm. and resectable. Is that right? Yes. Um, from a surgical standpoint, my preference is, is those, those tumors are a lot more straightforward um, than some of the more challenging tumors on this list. Um, and also, obviously, our long-term outcomes uh, are, are probably the best with those type of tumors as well. So. Okay. In the supratentorial compartment, there's a variety of tumors also, many of which are considered more low-grade. Again, astrocytomas, something called oligodendrogliomas, which we see more in adults or some, some in our older pediatric patients. Optic pathway gliomas, which can occur, occur very early in, in a child's life. Craniopharyngiomas uh, can come just about any age. And then pineal region tumors, which are not all that frequent. We're mm -hmm. much more likely to see a pineal region cyst, 
which is a completely uh, kind of benign and incidental finding for most all of the patients. So we do have a lot sent to us because of concerns from families or referring doctors. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think that the pineal region two, the germ cell tumors, um, some of these um, uh, tumors, we, we do see a, a higher um, incidence of those referred to us because we're a higher volume center for some, some of those tumors too. Yeah, this, this slide is a, is a potpourri slide of, of what the different types of tumors are and, and what make and what uh, percentage they occur in. Um, and the largest piece of that pie, it's probably a little bit hard to read, is the astrocytoma or the glioma group. And that's um, brain tumors uh, that arise from the brain substance itself. Um, so that is that um, the, 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 the supporting cells of the brain um, become the tumor themselves. And they're called astrocytomas or gliomas. Um, they range uh, from uh, grade two tumors, actually grade one tumors, all the way up to grade four, one being good tumors, four being um, malignant tumors or tumors that we don't want to have. Um, we're going to be talking today about the good tumors, the grade one and two tumors, the low grade uh, gliomas, but uh, that's kind of the largest piece of the pie. Um, you can see there's a lot of other pieces of the pie as well, um, from medulloblastomas to ependymomas, um, craniopharyngiomas, some of the things that we already discussed. Um, but in, in regards to the um, low-grade tumors, kind of the gliomas are the ones that make up the predominant pair, uh, piece of this pie. And one, one question that I'll get from other doctors and from families is you know, that grading system, grade mm -hmm. one, two, three, and four. And in adult brain tumor patients, there's a, a, a concern and a real a, a, a true reality that those grades can transform from grade two to three and move from grade three to four over time. Whereas we don't see that uh, in the pediatric population much at all. And in fact, Dr. Peter Berger, one of our uh, you know, great pediatric neuropathologists, um, will hit that home in his talk saying, you know, grade one is grade one and mm -hmm. it's going to stay grade one mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, not transform like some of the other uh, adult tumors that can start as a two and move on to three and four. So. Mm -hmm an important difference in our pediatric brain tumors. Now, many times people will say, is this benign or malignant? We really do avoid that malignant mm -hmm. word in pediatric brain tumors. Um, the location of the tumor itself can be malignant and very uh, life-threatening uh, because of the location, uh, even if it's a grade one tumor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so managing uh, these tumors based on their location takes uh, takes a lot of understanding and expertise, whether it's benign or malignant. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a question I think I get as well a lot as far as how to return this, as, as far as the malignant tumors go, is this cancer, is this not cancer? And these are, these are hard things because it's uh, case by case, um, and it's not only this the tumor type, but the tumor location and putting the whole, whole story together. Um, and so that's why, you know, we really have to sit down and, and discuss the whole the whole picture. Um, but today we're going to be talking about low-grade tumors. So yeah. that's uh, a lot of where we have some good success stories. Now, here at Mayo, we have been looking at our overall low-grade glioma population and uh, still kind of turning through some of the data. But uh, a group of patients going from 1990 to 2009 um, is, uh, is being looked at here, and I have some of our data to share today. Um, we think of 1990 as definitely in kind of the modern era because uh, all these patients have been imaged with MRI. It's not a mix of CAT scan and MRI, and um, treatment modalities have shifted a bit during this, this time, but I think overall for low-grade gliomas, this is a nice representative uh, group to share with you. So uh, this just points out that in a good-sized group of not quite 200 patients, um, pretty even mix of boys and girls. Mm -hmm. um, average age at diagnosis, almost 11 years old, but can range from infancy to you know, college age, the whole pediatric age uh, range there. Symptoms at presentation can really be uh, variable and multiple. Um, headaches, uh, seizures, sensory and motor symptoms, uh, along with the headaches frequently is vomiting. Um, more than half of our patients will have. Hello, uh, welcome back. We're sorry, we've had some technical difficulties on our end. Hopefully this uh, fixes everything. Um, we were told we were uh, just kind of finishing up on some of the symptoms of uh, that patients have with uh, low-grade gliomas. And now we're transitioning to um, discuss um, some of the data here at the Mayo Clinic 
uh, over uh, the last uh, you know, uh, 15 or so years, um, 20 years or so, um, with low-grade gliomas. So uh, as we love to point out, our patients are great survivors. This graph goes out to 12 years. Um, you know that overall survival is is more than ninety percent, and this you know if they get to this point you know and you extend on to twenty years and more, it really remains very stable at that point. Um, there there is a chance for recurrence, and what's important and we'll point out is that even with recurrence, survival remains you know, very good. Mm -hmm. And I think that this data is the Mayo Clinic data, but this also is reflective of the national data, um, where the low rate boom was at survival you know, at you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, so I think this is definitely a success story. Now, it's, it's always our favorite story to have a child who uh, comes in and is diagnosed and has a gross total resection. So, a child who has a low grade tumor. Uh, surgery is the treatment of choice whenever possible, whenever possible, doing it all out. We want pressure on Dr. Daniels here. Yeah. And um, but it's very satisfying, and you know, parents go through so much with that, and it's nice to say that's it. I think sometimes it's probably hard for them to imagine their life is so, you know, to go home, and um, but we follow up with them carefully with uh, observation over time. In those patients who are uh, just have a biopsy, any local patient who is probably not going to have to do it, in some of those with a subtotal resection, uh, we can very safely monitor the time and see if there's going to be any further you know, progression to the more small treatments. Mm -hmm. As uh, Dr. Keene was saying, surgery remains the mainstay for, for a lot of uh, low grade you know, brain tumors. And so that's uh, the question is how much we can safely do surgically. Um, we have such good long-term um, data and long-term survival that the goal really is to be able to be surgically safe um, and to not uh, have any additional deficits um, than we had prior to surgery, um, be able to get the diagnosis, um, and hopefully that we can get a cure. But it's not always possible because some of these you know, tumors can occur in the brainstem and around some very important structures. Um, so, from a surgical standpoint, the number one goal is to do surgery safely, obtain a tissue diagnosis, um, and then we can move forward. If we can get a gross total resection, that's the best case scenario, but that's not always possible. So, when we look at patients who uh, look at survival curves according to the degree of resection, this is comparing those with a total resection versus a subtotal resection or just a biopsy. Survival time is still very good. Not a, not a big difference in those two groups. Now you can see here that recurrence uh, is, occurs in 18%, and it's much more likely to occur if there's a subtotal resection. Um, so in the end, the survival uh, is fairly equal even when we do have recurrence. And we'll talk about a little bit uh, what we do when there is a recurrence here. Um, so after after a, a surgery, whether it's a gross total resection or subtotal resection, um, most all of the patients are observed initially with imaging studies at three month intervals, and then uh, the doctors kind of spread that out in four or six months. Um, and ultimately, I just see the kids for an annual checkup. We may continue to see them annually right up to the end of uh, high school or college. The median time to recurrence is just over five years. So that means half of all kids will be heard in the first five years that we observe them. But there can be recurrences later. And some of our patients, as they uh, hit their growth spurts with kidney, and they see some other uh, changes on uh, what was previously stable residual tumor. So it is important to uh, come back and see our team and, and get that reassurance um, or the attention that they need if there is a change. Um, when, when observation alone isn't enough, um, we have kind of a, a mix of uh, what's used for treatment, whether it's radiation therapy or chemotherapy, or a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Now, this patient did started in 1990, um, and prior to uh, 93 to 95, um, we didn't uh, have a reliable low-grade myeloma chemotherapy protocol. Um, but uh, we do now, starting in 93, and that's really changed um, and um, enabled us to put off radiation therapy in the case we do have some progression of residual tumor. 
This looks at how radiation therapy is quite effective. So most patients who do ultimately need radiation therapy, uh, this is looking at patients with and without uh, radiation therapy um, with those 12 receptions up on top. You can see that really not much difference in case of parents. We can have a full reception without radiation therapy. And there's probably some of the patients that are going on um, and uh, that wouldn't be our standard mm -hmm. And a receptive uh, low grade beam would be going to radiation therapy. Now, in this these lower graph too, the subfolio reception uh, patients, um, those who didn't have uh, radiation therapy did have more recurrence, um, but with the without recurrence, let's see, uh, you know, they had radiation therapy. You can see here, radiation therapy did it great. So that's not mm -hmm. necessarily good. Radiation therapy, if you recur, require radiation, it's not dropping the uh, gas or iron to that. I think that's really important to note that you know, even if they don't get a gross total reception, you don't have observation, we do have a recurrence, we do have the treatment you know, options available that become just as effective. So we're going to see about, talk about these treatment options. Um, radiation toxicity is what has led us to say, what about chemotherapy? And just to remind you of what, uh, what worries us, in, especially in young children who receive radiation therapy, is the impact on their brain uh, with their ability to learn. So IQ mm -hmm. loss does correlate with the age um, of treatment. And so mm -hmm. especially uh, treating preschool age children mm -hmm. is really, really uh, difficult with regard to their ultimate outcome mm -hmm. um, in their ability to be independent young adults. Yes. Um, the volume treated and the dose received also uh, impacts uh, you know, kind of this toxicity. There's endocrine side effects, increase in hearing loss, um, you know, visual side effects with cataracts. But again, as the neurologist, I'm, I'm kind of looking at their neurodevelopmental uh, outcome. And, and I think that this uh, next slide here um, from a great study from our colleagues at St. Jude's, Dr. Merchant and others, looked at radiation therapy and IQ outcome in a group of patients with low-grade gliomas, the optic mm -hmm. pathway uh, gliomas, and which is a common uh, tumor that occurs in school-age kids. Mm -hmm. And you see the top line there is 12-year-old mm -hmm. uh, patients treated, and their IQ really stays stable mm -hmm. over time. Um, whereas the bottom line, each line that goes down is a younger age, so kind of 12, 11, 10, mm -hmm. all the way down to five-year-olds, comparing their testing at time of diagnosis and five years later. So mm -hmm. these five-year-olds can drop you know, about 15 points mm -hmm. in IQ. Yeah. Um, and that's not trivial, and that mm -hmm. those kids need lots more supports yeah. at school. And we know that radiation hurts the developing brain more, and I think that that's what this data shows us. Um, this data came out of treating optic pathway gliomas, which is deep in the brain. And, and to be honest with you, these are the areas that we a lot of times have to treat with radiation because we can't get these tumors out um, completely with surgery. Um, and so I think that there are important structures that are nearby. And, um, and so that's why this data uh, shows us this. Um, and so I think that uh, it's important to note that we do have this therapy, but we'd like to reserve it um if we can till the patients are older yeah. um and preferably older than 12 even um, right right and we have we have in our in our our uh, brain tumor follow-up clinic a number of patients with low-grade gliomas who are diagnosed at a young age even some of them younger than five years old mm -hmm. and some of them have had gone through several different mm -hmm. courses of chemotherapy over the years just trying to kind of get that child older Mm -hmm. uh, before resorting to radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think every year that goes by, we feel like that's a success. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a trivial thing to put the kids through chemotherapy, but I think we're happy to avoid some of the radiation toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, talking a little bit about the chemotherapy, I mentioned earlier that after about 93, this article came out in 93, um, the use of carboplatinum and vincristine really became very standard for mm -hmm. our low-grade glioma patients. Using it as, um, as a stopgap measure, you know, after uh, a surgery that was mm -hmm. as much surgery as you could do or mm -hmm. a tumor that recurred after a period of quiescence after surgery, mm -hmm. um, and trying to avoid radiation therapy, and some of these patients avoid it altogether. Um, some, it just helps kind of pass some years. So I heard one colleague refer to carboplatinum and vincristine as the amoxicillin of pediatric oncologists. So those of you who are watching who are primary care providers, um, 
you know how how frequently <laughs> amoxicillin is your go-to medicine and and for for those of us who take care of kids with low-grade gliomas it's really our first line go-to chemotherapy mm -hmm. and it's an outpatient chemotherapy it's something that's generally very well tolerated mm -hmm. um, by the kids they continue in school and uh, may have a little drop in energy may have some thinning of the hair but overall mm -hmm. um, it's not the same kind of visual image you'd have of a child going through chemotherapy mm -hmm. for medulloblastoma or leukemia. Mm -hmm. And fantastic responses, mm -hmm. you know, for a newly diagnosed patient who perhaps just had a biopsy mm -hmm. um, and then received chemotherapy, 62%, so nearly two-thirds re mm -hmm. uh, respond. Mm -hmm. And in even those patients who had recurrence of disease or progression of mm -hmm. residual more than half respond. Mm -hmm. And so that, again, that allows those patients who are responders to put off mm -hmm. any radiation therapy uh, for a good long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, just kind of updating people on what we have to offer with regard to radiation therapy. It used to be, this is in the old days, and um, you know, just plain old lateral opposed beams, and they just mm -hmm. use a, an X-ray, a skull X-ray, as they're planning. Whereas these days, um, our kind of uh, standard of care is uh, what we call IMRT, so intensity modulated radiation therapy, and it really kind of has little individual beams that mm -hmm. are um, kind of conformal to the tumor area being uh, treated. And so this is a, an example down here in the corners, you have some MRIs, and then this superimposes the radiation treatment plan and kind of 100% of your treatment going in this central area. These other lines indicating the scatter, you know, so the outlying areas that are getting radiation therapy, whereas this is really our target. So you can see there is a fair mm -hmm. amount of scatter. Um, uh, so areas which you prefer not to treat are getting treated, and that's with IMRT. Mm -hmm. and we do have some progress in the immigration it's very exciting here at Mayo Clinic. Our Proton mm -hmm. Beam Center just had its grand opening, and you know, people have asked me, so what's the difference, protons and photons? Um, you know. Uh, what does it look like? I love this picture. It's really very helpful. This mm -hmm. photons is our, our standard radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and this shows you that, you know, kind of 100% of your treatment is the red here. And so the targeted treatment area is the spine in this child. So they're getting 100% to the targeted area. But look at the look mm -hmm. at the scatter so that their anterior chest wall is still getting about 75% of that mm -hmm. dose. And there's a lot of important structures there, lung and and heart and abdominal uh, contents. So um, look at the difference here with proton beam. You're getting your 100% treatment to the area desired, but in the anterior chest wall, you're getting zero. Mm -hmm. And so pictures like this really speak well for why mm -hmm. we're excited about protons. Mm -hmm. And, and for us who deal with the brain, um, you know, there's a lot of intricate and delicate structures within the brain. So you can obviously imagine how excited we are to be able to offer this technology to be able to help save, you know, some of the very important areas of the brain to, to try to prevent um, uh, radiation toxicity, some of the things that we're just talking about now. Okay. So and here's here's uh, not quite as colorful as the 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 example given with a child's spine being radiated, but this is IMRT, our you know, kind of the current standard of care versus protons and how much is being treated. So red, the 100% dose going here, likewise here, but uh, still, a, still a scatter of 10% of that dose going out and in, involving that much of the brain. Um, and 10% you know, of you know 5,000 is still a reasonable amount. Whereas here with protons, it's really kind of tightly mm -hmm. uh, constrained. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 So I guess we're having technical difficulties with our, our slides as well. Um, I re apologize for that. Uh, we're going to go over some cases now to uh, kind of highlight the things that we we're discussing. It's kind of my favorite part of what we were going to do. Yeah. But um, uh, I guess since uh, since people can't see them, that maybe we should uh, we can maybe discuss one or two of those cases um, and then uh, and then start taking questions. So um, the mm -hmm. first case was uh, was a, a 12 month old um, female that that um, basically you know a young child shows up with the increasing head circumference. Um, and this is a not too uncommon scenario um, that that we do see. Um, and you know, a child that has a head circumference growth that is supposed to be at uh, seventy five percent or ninety percent should stay on that curve. Mm -hmm. And if we see deviation from that, that's something that we should worry about. Yeah. 
So this little girl was being watched. She was from a, you know, kind of a good, robust uh, mm -hmm. family from uh, right along the Mississippi, so Minnesota or Wisconsin. And, um, and her family didn't have particularly small head sizes either. She came to our attention when she was seen in the emergency room. She uh, took a tumble at daycare, vomited afterwards, seemed a little, little wobbly. That said, she was just 13 months and she wasn't yet walking. Um, and the other kind of piece of her history was she'd acquired some, some esotropia, so a little bit of lazy eye, and they'd been uh, kind of waiting to get in to see the ophthalmologist. And so those pieces of information there, you know, large head that was really going off the curve in retrospect, and um, combined with some acquired esotropia mm -hmm. after the first six months of life was it was a concerning story. The ophthalmologist saw her and uh, and contacted me, and we went ahead and got an imaging study. Um, little children can can build up very large head size, a lot of fluid in their head before they're actually uh, come to any attention because the ability for the for the brain to expand or for the skull to expand really helps mm -hmm. them compensate. And um, so this little girl had impressive uh, enlargement of her lateral and third ventricles um, with a sizable posterior fossa tumor mm -hmm. that was both cystic and solid. Mm -hmm. um, so even at her very young age, uh, she, when we introduced her to our neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. she underwent a gross total resection, had a pretty straightforward, uncomplicated hospital course, mm -hmm. did not require a shunt, mm -hmm. which is another kind of nice goal. Mm -hmm. We're able to avoid a shunt in mm -hmm. more than more than three quarters of the patients, wouldn't yeah. you say? Yeah, about 20% shunt rate is what I think of her posterior fossa tumors. Um, in, in the, I know you can't see the images for this, but it really shows a large um, uh, kind of circular cystic lesion, so mostly filled with fluid that's in the, the back part of the brain, which we call that posterior fossa, um, and that can plug the plumbing for the brain, and that's where the hydrocephalus develops. So the, the fluid-filled cavities get blocked, and so they, they develop these large, um, large amount of fluid, hydrocephalus meaning fluid on the brain, and that's where the large head comes from, and that's where a lot of the symptoms come from. Um, from a surgical standpoint, these cases are probably the most straightforward that we have. Um, they're very large cysts. The actual amount of tumor can be a lot of times very small uh, in, in relationship to how much cyst is present or how much fluid is present. And we really only have to go after the tumor cells and reconfigure that out by using contrast or some of the dyes that we give um, during the MRI scan. And this patient that we're talking about here, um, pathology came back as a juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma or a grade one uh, glioma. And this is the best case scenario that we have. Um, for, for, for brain tumors. So this little girl is now, uh, she'll be starting kindergarten at mm -hmm. the end of the summer and it's just a delight to see her. She's, mm -hmm. she's kind of full of energy, does all kinds of uh, age appropriate activities and really mm -hmm. isn't going to be any different from her peers. Yeah. Um, she did as you know, she was kind of going through those early milestones. She was unsteady. Mm -hmm. uh, it did take a little longer to walk mm -hmm. independently. But like I said, you know, upon entering kindergarten, I really don't think there's going to be any mm -hmm. real difference between her and her peers mm -hmm. uh, for her gross or fine motor skills at this point. So it's really mm -hmm. a great story. Yeah. I think I think the next case that we had again, apologize that you can't see the slides. This is a, an older uh, child now, a 16 year old girl who presented. Um, I think last fall here to the Mayo Clinic with seizures. Um, again, as an early part of our talk, that's one of the one of the, the main things that, that children can present with um, with tumors. And so she had a one-time seizure. She was started on some seizure medication, but um, a, a scan of her brain was done and found an, uh, an abnormality in the left temporal lobe. Um, and she was referred to us uh, for that. Um, the this is the first time that we had seen her, this is the first scans that she had, and so the real big question is, is what do you do with a one-time seizure? You find something in the brain that doesn't belong there. What's the next step? Do you jump to surgery right away, or is this something that you watch? And I think these are um, important questions that we as a neuro-oncology team um, need to sit down and, and talk with the parents and, and come up with what, what we think is the best for each patient, because it's um, what's good for one patient is not necessarily always what's best for all the patients. Yeah, one of the challenges with this girl is that it was in her left temporal lobe, so her dominant hemisphere. Mm -hmm. With regard to seizures, um, if if the patient is meeting Dr. Daniels, it's because there's seizures and a tumor. Now, looking mm -hmm. at the Rochester Epidemiology Project, I had the mm -hmm. opportunity to look through that 
for all patients with new onset seizure, the proportion of those patients, mm -hmm. new onset seizure, less than one half of one percent mm -hmm. had a brain tumor as the cause. Mm -hmm. So there's there's plenty of other reasons for new onset seizure in the pediatric population. Um, but when they as the neurosurgeon, that's not the case. <laughs> right, right. Well, you see a very a, a slim a, a sliver of our mm -hmm. of our new new onset seizure patients. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, in that decision of, oh, you know, it's just one one uh, seizure. Do we watch and wait, or or hand them over to the neurosurgeons? There is good data about um, the sooner you take care of the seizures, the more likely they are to be seizure free. Mm -hmm. So, in patients who had a lesion responsible for their seizures, who were observed and just treated with medication over time, in those patients whose diagnosis of seizures was more than one year. Mm -hmm at the time of their surgery. Their likelihood of being seizure free in the long term was less than those who had their surgery within a year of onset of seizures. This is interesting data to think about and, mm -hmm. and does enter into our discussions with families. Mm -hmm. Definitely does and I, I use that kind of as a guiding principle for me when patients present with seizures and a brain tumor. I think that that is something that, that we can watch it for a little while but I don't like to watch it usually over that year period of time for that very reason because our, our you know, I don't want to lessen the, the chance that we get from not just a cure from the tumor but a cure from the seizures as well mm -hmm. to not have to be on antiepileptics the entire life. Um, it's a different question or different management strategy though if it's found a tumor is found incidentally doesn't have a seizure mm -hmm. um, and then then sometimes just watching these sometimes these tumors don't do anything right. um, on, on interval scanning um, and and may not ever need any type of intervention so that's always hard to know and that's what the so-called incidentaloma mm -hmm. where a child uh, has a scan of their head for headaches or uh, you know playground or sports injury and they oh gosh you know there's there's uh, no acute problem here but there's uh, there's a lump here that looks like tumor and so that that to happen in those patients where there's symptom mm -hmm. uh, just following is is usually our first line. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, with the patients with seizures, another important thing in our pediatric group, as uh, as opposed to the adult group, is um, the seizures and tumors in children. Just about all of those are low grade mm -hmm. gliomas, whereas in adults who have new onset seizure uh, caused by tumor. Is more frequently uh, a more high grade tumor or a metastatic tumor. So, mm -hmm. pediatric and adult brain tumor uh, situations are, are quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, nice to show you the scans. We, we um, uh, went to surgery probably within three to four months of uh, her presentation. Okay, we, do, we are up. Okay. And, uh, and we um, uh, did the case in our uh, state of the art intraoperative MRI. Uh, OR suite, and that's so where where we can actually do a case in the operating room and simultaneously um, get a scan, a brain scan, to show us how how we've done. I guess if we hadn't been live before, the lesion is this white uh, lesion here in the left temporal lobe, um, the white abnormality that we can see on the scan here, and. It's sometimes counterintuitive, but the smaller the lesion is, it's the harder it is to know that you got it all out. Very large lesions kind of press everything away um, and kind of do some of the surgical dissection for you. Um, so the smaller the lesion is, the harder it is for me as a surgeon to be convinced that I actually have taken the whole um, tumor out. And so that's why this uh, tumor was done in our intraoperative scanner so we can get a scan during the case before we close to say that yes, we have taken the whole tumor out. So this was um, this MRI scan was done in the intraoperative scanner in our suite. Um, and I was just gonna fast forward to uh, post-operative now, six months uh, from surgery, I just saw her um, uh, recently uh, the other day. She came back for a recent scan um, and has a, has a great looking scan. Uh, there's no uh, recurrence, there's no abnormalities that we can see uh, on the imaging. Um, and this pathology was a D, DNET, a dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor. That's a mouthful to say, so I try not to say it, just DNET. Um, but it's under the kind of the overall classification of a low-grade glioma and has uh, has the same kind of long-term outcomes. DNETs are, are kind of uh, common tumors found in those patients who present with seizure. Mm -hmm. So we really expect her to be a surgical cure mm -hmm. and, and a cure of her seizures as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. 
Should we start taking questions now? I think that uh, we're starting to get long on time. And again, we apologize for our uh, inconvenience with our, our technical difficulties here. Um, we had a couple more cases to go to go over. One of my favorite cases was next, but we can uh, save that for another time. Okay. So thanks. Well, we're going to start with some questions here, mm -hmm. and. Um, Let's see, the first question for us is, mm -hmm. what news is there concerning the prognosis mm -hmm. of tactile gliomas after the onset of puberty? Mm -hmm. um, when biopsy cannot be done, mm -hmm. how sure can one be that mm -hmm. there is a grade one tumor? Well, with the tactile plate gliomas, I just saw a patient mm -hmm. uh, in follow-up yesterday who presented after puberty. Um, he's now a college graduate, and I was sharing with him that my oldest patient that mm -hmm. I diagnosed with a tectal plate glioma was in her 50s, mm -hmm. and um, with some one that I saw uh, mm -hmm. when I was still in training. And um, but we we see tectal plate gliomas in all ages, mm -hmm. um, and uh, generally speaking, the patients I've taken care of have not even had a biopsy. Mm -hmm. I did take care of one patient whose tectal plate lesion was resected in mm -hmm. a smaller center. Um, it didn't go. Mm -hmm. without a lot of side effects. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts on biopsying a tectal plate glioma? Yeah, uh, from a surgical um, viewpoint, when we see a lesion in, in the tectal plate, um, this is something that we usually just want to do interval scanning mm -hmm. and, and to say, you know, is our hand forced to actually do something? Is this going to grow? Is this going to cause problems? Uh, I have biopsy tectal plate gliomas. I probably did two over the last year. Um, and that's either A, because it's accessible. So sometimes the tectal plate, it can grow off the tectal plate and be in the ventricular uh, system. And so we can use an endoscope and actually do it minimally invasively. So if I see a lesion that we can actually get to safely to get a piece of tissue, um, I think that then, then it's something that, yes, I feel comfortable that we can go after a piece of tissue. However, a lot of these are actually confined to the tectal plate and they don't grow out into the ventricles. And in these cases, um, the usual course is so indolent that um, that we just watch these with serial scans. And, um, you know, if you've been followed for five years, for 10 years, and there's really been no change um, in that uh, tumor, then I would say that, that that's a tectal plate glioma and the chance of it having to, ha you know, to cause problems in the patient's lifetime is quite low. And so we wouldn't proceed with anything. I know our chairman recently took out a tectal plate glioma. I saw the results of that. Um, and uh, that was because um, something had been followed for a long period of time and then did start to grow a bit and was causing symptoms. Um, and as you said, that there are going to be surgical side effects for operating in that location. Um, but that patient did get better, I know, over, over a handful of weeks and, and did, did pretty well. So there are options. So first, first line of therapy in our tectal plate gliomas is management of the hydrocephalus because that's generally the, the manner in which they present. And, <laughs> I think they're they're really a very satisfying group of patients to take care of. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to our next question. Mm -hmm. um, son had a benign ganglial glioma entirely re removed. Severe migraines had started some 20 days straight. Tried many medicines. Is this common? Is it tricky to figure out the correct medication? Any mm -hmm. other options we can look into? So I, I have to say I'm involved in the care of a lot of kids who have um, headaches after their treatment for um, brain tumor. And it, it, it is, you know, it's a kind of a higher anxiety situation because I think it, on the one hand, we're, we're worried or the patient or family's worried, is there still tumor to deal with? Um, and that's obviously something important to uh, attend to, a benign ganglial glioma entirely removed. We don't worry quite so much about that. Other causes for headaches like hydrocephalus need to be considered. Um, migraines have some pretty typical characteristics though, and um, migraines can be triggered by so many things, um, you know, a, you know, physiologic challenge of, you know, going through an illness or, or a surgery and um, brain tumor is, uh, and brain tumor surgery is a bit of a controlled mm -hmm. head trauma in a mm -hmm. way. So illness, injury, head trauma, those things can all trigger onset of migraine headaches or a, a kind of a cluster, um, of migraine headaches can be, and it can be tricky to uh, to treat. Um, when you have headaches that are going on for 20 days straight, using your usual acute care, your urgent care, things like ibuprofen, um, Aleve, the over-the-counter medicines, um, 
when you're that many days into it, it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. um, we try and avoid narcotics. Some of our patients do have to come to the emergency room and may do better if they get some IV fluids, some IV uh, medications like Toradol. There's a, a whole mm -hmm. variety of approaches to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say you know, just kind of hanging in there and that gradually things improve over time and we get away from the from the mm -hmm. headache difficulties in that year mm -hmm. after surgery. Mm -hmm. So hang in there with that. And, yeah. and uh, you know, it, it, it is a lot of trial and error that's not uncommon with the medications in that situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, uh, what is the significance of the IDH1 mutation in pediatrics? Um, this is in reference, it looks to a 10-year-old female with uh, uh, two low-grade diffuse astrocytomas. Um, I do a lot of um, uh, basic science laboratory research as well, and so I guess I can comment on that a little bit um, as far as the biology um, of these um, tumors. Um, IDH1 um, uh, is a part of the um, citric acid cycle, and it has been found to be very important um, uh, in, in adult uh, gliomas, where there's a subset of these adult gliomas that come back with the IDH1 mutation, and that confers a favorable prognosis uh, for, those, um, for those patients. Again, these are usually young adults um, that have the IDH1 uh, mutation. It's very uncommon for a child uh, to have the IDH1 mutation. And so I think that um, in my mind, if I were to see that, is that this tumor is probably gonna behave differently than the tumors that I would typically think of as a grade two tumor or whatever grade that it is. I don't think of pediatric low-grade gliomas a lot of times as transforming to higher-grade tumors. They usually kind of stay themselves, and we started to talk about this early on. But if I were to see that, that would be something I would watch carefully for, um, is that uh, that the biology of this tumor may be different than the standard biology um, uh, present for, for pediatric tumors. Um, I don't know of uh, any, we do have some ongoing trials for IDH1 tumors in adults. I don't think there's any for children. I don't, I don't know that. Right. It sounds like a 10-year-old you know, girl who's had two yeah. estrocytomas. It's a, unusual, and I'm sure that uh, some very careful observations. Yes. Uh, there are some conditions that do have a likelihood for multiple yes. tumors, and so it makes us uh, watchful and thoughtful about those situations, too. Mm -hmm. Our next question that comes up is a three-year-old child with pyelomyxoid astrocytoma, and are there clinical trials for this, and can this transform to a higher grade? So pyelomyxoid astrocytoma is something a lot of people may not have heard about. Uh, these tumors used to be more lumped in with the pilocytic astrocytomas, uh, but pyelomyxoid may be uh, more likely to be seen in the very young children, so in this child's case, three-year-olds, so preschool age. Um, and can it transform to a higher grade? I think what, what we think of these as is, even though they may call them a grade one, they may be a little bit more challenging to treat, mm -hmm. may be more likely to recur, or I think many that I think of are not necessarily in a spot that's easy to reset. Mm -hmm. So they may be a little bit more centrally located, mm -hmm. um, adding to the challenge. Uh, are there specific clinical trials for just pyelomyxoid astrocytomas? Not that I'm aware of. I know there's kind of a, mm -hmm. a consortium of patients who, you know, kind of uh, are collected and mm -hmm. they've been looked at carefully, but I don't mm -hmm. think there's individual trials. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, other I, comments pyelomyxoid astrocytomas, uh, from my standpoint, are quite challenging. Um, they're um, a lot of times, as you said, occurring in spots of the brain that are very hard to get a complete resection from. And even when we get a complete mm -hmm. resection, believe it or not, I've seen the recurrence come back very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to keep a very careful and watchful eye on these tumors. Um, I know that we're currently treating two patients here um, uh, for pyelomyxoid that recurred very quickly with gross mm -hmm. total resections mm -hmm. and uh, are undergoing chemotherapy. So it's we always start with observation. Um, but but you know quickly move to additional therapy if it's needed. Yeah. Um, so they are they are tricky tumors, um, and I don't know of any uh, specific clinical trials. Most of those are actually lumped in, I think, and included with the pilocytic trials. Right. Um, and so, but I don't think that there's anything specific for its own. I think I think they kind of get separated out as the kind of mm -hmm. their own diagnostic entity. Mm -hmm. Um, in the later 90s, is that right? Is yeah, that I'd right say, yeah, I'd say early 2000s, somewhere okay. around that, I think, um, 
you know, Dr. Peter Berger um, exactly. at Johns Hopkins is the first person to have um, pulled this part out. There was a subset of younger um, kids that had what we thought were pilocytics that just weren't doing as well. Uh -huh. And it's that's the group, uh, the pathology looks a little bit different. The outcomes are a little bit different. The time to recurrence is different. Um, so yes, this is a very new diagnosis. So we don't have any real long-term data right. even to say, um, you know, how these kids do long-term because they were traditionally lumped in with the pilocytics. I think um, like we were saying earlier though, that uh, trials of chemotherapy rather than resorting to radiation therapy is still the the goal in these children is, you know, put off radiation therapy as long as possible. These tumors do tend to come in our younger tumor patients and, um, uh, you know, just kind of very judiciously using chemotherapy and keeping these kids as safe and healthy as possible, but um, keeping in mind that, you know, that chemotherapy uh, struggle is worthwhile when you can put off the radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. Another question that comes up here is uh, ganglion, ganglioglioma tumor removed. And so a very low grade tumor, no sign of regrowth, uh, doing well, however, emotionally struggling. Uh, is this common to be stressed and frustrated and part of the tumor surgery or is it simply a childhood issue? Great question. Um, I think some of that, uh, I mean, any child and family, uh, this is a major stressor to go through such a serious diagnosis, even in the most kind of benign mm -hmm. of brain tumors, mm -hmm. um, it's a, a big stress. Um, and so addressing that stress level of parents and child is important. Now, some tumor locations can um, predispose mm -hmm. people to higher level of stress or behavioral side effects mm -hmm. too. And so you have to take it as a case by case um, situation. We're really fortunate here at Mayo. We talked about the importance of multidisciplinary team in you know, tumor survival and in tumor outcomes, so that quality of outcome. And mm -hmm. we have fantastic um, supports in psychology here who are very experienced in dealing with kids with uh, serious medical conditions like mm -hmm. uh, cancer, brain tumors, mm -hmm. epilepsy. And, um, and so they can help give patients and families some perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a, those patients who have ongoing difficulties with pain and anxiety. We have an excellent um, program for pain rehabilitation too, mm -hmm. which um, a number of our brain tumor survivors have gone through in their mm -hmm. adolescent years, and it's it's been hugely helpful. Yeah. Uh, the next question is: uh, Is intractable weight gain, along with other endocrine symptoms, uh, hypothalamic obesity, uh, normal? Um, so the, it's a: Have you seen it after optic pathway tumor uh, in the chiasm in the hypothalamus? Um, and, uh, and or following surgery and chemotherapy. That's the first part of the question. And I would say that absolutely, this is a very uh, big uh, um, issue. And I think uh, one of our last our last case that, that we were gonna present uh, did discuss this a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, anytime you have a tumor in and around the hypothalamus, um, which the optic uh, uh, apparatus and chiasm are uh, in that general location, um, so the optic pathway gliomas, craniopharyngiomas, and sometimes other uh, tumors like uh, pilocytics can be there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is a very challenging um, uh, location from uh, a standpoint of uh, surgery and from treatment if you're doing radiation and other things to this region. Um, there's a lot of important uh, functions that run uh, through this area. The hypothalamus controls kind of your master regulator of a lot of functions in your body. Um, and one of them is your ability to feel hunger, to feel um, that I'm I'm full now, mm -hmm. um, in addition to, to regulating all the other hormones and, and things. And so um, injury to the hypothalamus can can lead uh, people that have a very normal body habitus become exceedingly obese. Um, and uh, and that's a major problem after these types yeah. of surgeries. It, it, I've seen it in very young children. I've seen it in uh, teenagers who are very determined not to be gaining weight. Um, and it's it's a really tough situation. Uh, a lot of times you're struggling with saying, okay, we've got a lot of hormone uh, things. Let's go to the endocrinologist. If we could just get the thyroid hormone regulated or their core tef dose just right, things would be okay. Um, or you know, if we could uh, just get them you know kind of more awake and sleeping better, things would be better. Those things are all important. You've got to have you know kind of your endocrine function regulated as optimally as possible. You've got to be getting good rest. These kids are also mm -hmm. at risk for um, sleep apnea. 
and a secondary narcolepsy. So the, the overweight puts them at risk for sleep apnea, but mm -hmm. there's a secondary narcolepsy that's completely independent of weight mm -hmm. that can have these kids quite sleepy. And that also contributes to the, to the obesity issue. And um, managing that, um, our endocrinologists here are just mm -hmm. kind of putting forth a, a, mm -hmm. a proposal for a study um, of, you know, kind of a, a way of uh, uh, trying to manage this, mm -hmm. some, some new ideas. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think whether you're the surgeon, the neurologist, the oncologist, we, we all share that, that frustration and concern that these mm -hmm. patients and their families go through. And so um, yeah. there have been some some hopeful uh, mm -hmm. pieces of information, but still not an obvious mm -hmm. answer. Yeah, yeah. We, we, as I was alluding to, that we're hopefully going to be starting a study to actually look at this, uh, an actual trial with um, multiple medications to see if, if we can um, change or help um, the outcome uh, with this. So. Mm -hmm. so a number of years back at um, St. Jude's, there mm -hmm. was a, a, a trial that we were all very hopeful about mm -hmm. using octreotide, mm -hmm. and unfortunately it didn't it didn't deliver what we were really hoping it it, uh, it would. Um, I'm really excited to see there's just mm -hmm. uh, more interest in moving forward, even though it's a, a small patient okay. population. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I think the next one uh, is uh, when speaking of uh, having long-term uh, cognitive issues, um, was this in connection to the proton beam radiation or whole uh, brain uh, radiation? So great question. Um, and uh, what we're hoping is that with proton beam radiation, as we were demonstrating with some of those images, less of the brain is getting radiated. So less volume radiated uh, means less side effects. So um, uh, hopefully less cognitive issues and other radiation induced side effects. Um, still, you're not going to get away from, from uh, radiation induced uh, cognitive changes and just tumor related cognitive changes. Um, the, uh, so protons or photons can change IQ, whole brain versus focused area treated mm -hmm. um, also impact. So mm -hmm. you know, if you're just irradiating the posterior fossa, for mm -hmm. example, that impact on IQ would be a whole lot different than, for example, uh, irradiating the left temporal lobe or mm -hmm. the, the uh, hypothalamic region. Mm -hmm. Um, one question I think that uh, I want to answer here or address here is, um, uh, have I, this is the, the question, I've heard that uh, a JPA in the brainstem tends to stop growing in their 20s, is this true? Um, we had a, a slide <laughs> that we didn't present and you weren't able to see um, that uh, is from the Sears database. This is basically a large database of um, of uh, everyone around the country puts, puts data into there and we can extract uh, information from that. And one of it things that people looked at was what are the long-term outcomes of children with low-grade gliomas and, and JPA uh, tumor, the pilocytic gastrocytomas, made up one of the large percentage um, of that, um, of the of the study. So 4,000 low-grade uh, brain tumors were, were studied and the looked at the long-term outcomes and the 20, 30-year survival rates were 90% as we talked about. But what really born out of that data that, that we noticed is the fact that um, if um, children that had these tumors could make it to their 20s, 25, you know, something like that, the tumors just stopped growing. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, not specific mm -hmm. for um, uh, brainstem JPAs, but I think it's as a class, low-grade tumors, pediatric low-grade gliomas um, have that feature, and that is something that uh, is um, one of the parting comments that I would like everyone to kind of kind of know, and one of the reasons why we wanted to do this is to get that message out there, is that, um, is that we do have really great long-term survivals, but if we can get these children into their 20s and 30s, these tumors just stop becoming a problem. Um, and I think that that's the goal of everything that we do now is to do no harm and to yeah. get these children um, to those ages um, that these that these tumors just stop becoming a problem. And you know, in keeping in mind that the treatments that we use, uh, getting them to adult age, um, they will carry the risks for side effects from that you know into their adult years. And so. Uh, you know, again, minimizing our radiation exposure and when needing radiation exposure, we're really excited about um, our availability of proton beam here in Rochester. Um, uh, increasing the age at which a child is treated with radiation, decreasing the volume, decreasing the area surrounding the tumor that uh, inadvertently gets treated are all things that will, will help improve that quality of survival for the, for the young adults who are our survivors. Mm -hmm. so. 
Well, we thank you very much for your time. It looks like our hour is up. Um, we apologize again for our, our technical issues and uh, thanks for staying with us if you're, if you're still there. Um, we didn't get to all the questions, so we'll try to answer any additional questions uh, during the following week that'll be posted uh, here. So um, again, thank you very much.